Welcome back to the channel. Uh, at the time I was saying this, I don't know if I'm actually going to publish this video. And that's because the last video and this video I am doing very little prep for. And that's because I want to show you how I start some of these machine learning projects with analytical data. So to review where we are, I have this data set that came from this particular publication where they're using a near IR spectrometer to authenticate chicken. And this data was collected for a machine learning application. So a great data set to practice on. The URL can be found in the description. And if you have other data sets that would be interesting for videos, let me know in the comments below. But to review where we are, we are talking about infrared data that was collected between 900 and 1600 nanometers. So this is not visible light. We're now looking at vibrations and rotations of chemical bonds. And from that, we can use these fingerprints to determine if the chicken is authentic or some other outlier material. The data was collected on a low resolution near infrared spectrometer. So we know that we have some limitations of what we can see just due to that. Um, and that the material was tested under a number of different conditions. If we move to the notebook, we've already imported the data. Here are some of the experimental information from the publication. And then here is the table for that data. I want to start from there and figure out what we might want to do next. So if we make sure we have this data table in our environment and we'll get a larger preview of the data frame, we see that we have replication with the sample number, the production system, the scan type seems to be replicated as well, and freshness. And so when exploring this the last time, we noticed that there were there was a line that said that there were replicates run. And so it, it would make sense to perform some sort of aggregation on this data. But first, let's ensure that this is the case. So one thing I would do is sort of select a group. So maybe we look at the uh, sample number 372738 and see what we've got there. So let's do that. Let's query sample number equals 372738. And when we look at that, we see that for this particular sample, it has uh, the production system is con it's conventional. It has been tested uh, two different times. So on meat and through package. And then we have five frozen, five thawed for both on meat, and then the same in either case. So let's also look at the sample type OM. So let's put this in parentheses and let's add a second condition where we say scan type equals equals OM. And because this is a OM or a scan type is a string, we will use the double quotes because we're already using the single quote for the query statement. And then we'll make sure we close everything. And now you see we have two conditions we're querying, the scan, the sample number and the scan type. We have both conditions wrapped in parentheses, followed by the ampersand, and then another set. And so now we have just essentially controlled sample number and scan type. And the only variable here really is the freshness. And we can see how the freshness you know, frozen or thawed impacts the chemical fingerprint of this material. So we have this sample here. What I want to do now is group by. So we're chaining a lot of methods together. When we're doing this, I like to use parentheses so that I can split the lines. And so we have our data frame. We have our query statement. Let's now chain based on the freshness. So let's just aggregate on freshness. So we're gonna group by the freshness column. So these five FRs come together, these five TH samples come together and let's take the mean value. And here we wanna say numeric only just to avoid a particular error message that will come up because when we tell it to perform the average, it does look at all the columns and so you can't really take the average of these string values we just want to ensure that we're looking at the numerical data 
So we'll just say numeric only equals true. And now you see that we essentially just have our sample number, which is uh, numeric, and we have our actual uh, chemical fingerprint information, these, these wave numbers, these wave links here. So what I want to do next is say I look all the rows and let's say column one and beyond uh, one and beyond and then lastly let's plot this actually last night before we do that let's transpose so we, we have our two columns and then let's make a quick plot so we can get an idea of these fingerprints and so we see that Overall, the, 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 the signals are highly correlated with each other. Um, there are some differences around 1,500 to 1,600 nanometers um, between the frozen and the thawed samples. Uh, let's change the scan type. So I don't recall what scan type values are. we have are. So one thing you can do is open up a console for the notebook. So they can have a way to query this and find the information we want to know. So let's look at scan type specifically. And I want the unique values for scan type. So we run that and we see that for the unique values we have OM, TP, and TB. And so let's switch OM with TP. And what I want to see here is if, if we continue to group by freshness and we change the scan type from on me to through package, do we see a similar correlation between the samples? And here, when we look at through package, whether it's frozen or thawed, there is a significant difference, at least in the baseline, although the signals still seem to be highly correlated with each other. And so this is maybe a way we want to subset the data. We might just look at all of the on meat samples and then the through package samples. I don't recall if there was a TB option for this particular sample. It appears that was not. Um, so this sample did not have the, I think this is through package on the bottom. Less important here, but so either way this shows we, we definitely want to make sure we have a good control of what variables we're plotting or comparing if we do start to build some models. Let's do the same thing for some other sample numbers. So let's get an idea of the sample numbers. Let's get just unique values. And let's pick another one randomly. Let's say 378, 331. And let's put that here. I think if I were doing this again, I would actually have a variable at the top of the cell called sample number, and I would put that in here. But for simplicity, let's just do the same thing. And we see that we, we have an even bigger difference in the larger wavelengths. And then let's look at the on meat. When testing me directly, we see the signals are much closer. So I think generally speaking, although we are seeing some differences as a function of uh, the packaging, the signals are correlated, but whether the materials are frozen or thawed matters much less when directly testing on meat versus through the package. So that's good to know. Uh, we've, we've done these sort of chain methods before to, to experiment Let's see how you might want to tweak this to look at some other conditions. Let's see what our production system options are. So let's say df.productionsystem.unique. And we have comb, comb with a space. So this is something we should definitely clean up. Um, this, this white space here is probably not unique, or it, it appears unique, but it's probably not meant to be unique. Um, so definitely worth looking at. And one way we can we can maybe explore this even more if we were to do df.production system dot value counts. Yeah, we see that we're splitting one of these has an extra white space on it. It's hard to tell in this case, but it, it really doesn't appear to be anything substantial. Maybe there's multiple users and one person added a white space or an extra space at the end or Excel made some uh, whatever data record tracking they used had this error. So we would definitely want to clean this up um, there. There's a number of, of easy ways to address this, but definitely worth looking at. Um, so it's so a good thing we checked. 
but we have we have conventional, we have one star, organic, two star, standard. I'm guessing we need to look at some of these other what these other variables mean, and I think we can find that in the publication. Yeah, so SED is a standard chicken. FR is free range. CF is corn fed. So actually, let's copy this information. This is definitely worth having directly in our notebook. And let's add this. Um, let's add this in the cell below. So I'm going to change. So right now, this is a code cell. If I if I'm in the code cell and I push Escape and then M, it changes it to a Markdown cell. And then I want to copy this. Now, in this case, they're using the pound sign as sort of a, a, an unordered list. I need to change that because pound signs actually have a specific meaning in Markdown. So if we use pound signs, you see that we are now just making a level one header. We don't want to do that. So instead, let's do something like this dash, which will give us a bullet. So to get back in, we just double click and then I would just copy. Let me see if I can do this right. So I can control, I'm on a Mac, so I can control click or command click the same spot and risk it all. So let's just do this. And I'm holding command. If you're on a Windows computer, you would just hold control and it's on the backspace and then put the hyphen there. And now I have an unordered bulleted list with the various parameters. So conventional chicken, one star. So this is just good information to have as you think about this this data. Because of that and, and wanting to be able to track it, let's create a new view for the notebook. And let's put that here as well. So now we have the option if we want to scroll over, we have the console if we want to just run a few tests without actually changing code in the notebook. We have a second view that allows us to sort of track these variables and continue coding further down. So these are now looking at the same notebook, uh, just different lines. You could work on either side, but just a good way to sort of keep track as you work through understanding this data. So. The next thing we should do is let's look at the production, the effect of the production system. And to do that, I also want to aggregate. So let's just say, uh, let's make our parentheses. We should probably going to change some methods. Top line DF and let's group by production system. And let's say you forget, you're like, okay, group by you, you do this. And you get this a call when you when you get a an object like this, we actually still need to do an operation on it to render that information. And so the next thing I want to do is just take the mean and let's pass numeric only. Actually, let's not do numeric only. Let's just say mean. And we get this warning. So this is the warning we were trying to avoid, which is now saying that in the future, the numeric only will be set to false. And so we're just sort of handling that now so we can avoid that warning. So let's just say numeric only equals true. And it doesn't necessarily change the output. So it's not necessarily an error statement, but this just helps your code in the future to run. If you say update your pandas that um, will have a different output. So this helps you to just avoid that in the future. And we see we have our data. Let us do the same thing where we iloc. We want all the rows. Well, we want column one to the end. This is just going to get rid of the sample number, which means nothing in this case. And now we have the average chemical fingerprint for the one star, two star. Um, and actually, we'll keep this. So we, we remember we have the conventional chicken that has to throw this split. Let's look at what it looks like now that they were actually going to go and fix it. And I'll show you how we can do that. OK, so let's now add our plot. We're not going to focus too much on making the plot look good. This happened because I forgot to transpose the data. So let's do that. And you can see that we are looking at very, 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 very small changes in these data. 
Um, some of these shifts along the y-axis might go away once we do some more pre-processing of this data before any machine learning algorithm. So we're, we're looking at tiny changes in these fingerprints around these various wavelengths, not necessarily the big change over the time because we can, we can adjust some of that with some pre-processing. If we look at the purple and red traces for this conventional chicken, it's kind of interesting that, that they are really far apart in some areas, which could just be a matter of timing. Maybe some of it was, was analyzed earlier. There was some instrument drift and others analyzed much later. Um, just again, an interesting observation. So one thing we can do is if we want to explore this conventional variable a little bit more, let's say we want to filter production system and let's say str.contains and we want to just conv. This will capture both the conventional chicken without the space and with that space at the end when we do it this way. And this will give us a Boolean list that we can use to filter the data frame. And so now we're just getting our conventional chicken. And to demonstrate that we're getting what we want, let's select this variable here and look at the unique values. We see we have both unique values there. So the one with the space and one without the space. Another way we could have done that is to do n unique. That would give us a number of unique values. Again, we know we had two before, we have two afterwards. So just one option to see that. Now we can address this by uh, doing another chain uh, string method. We could do str.strip and nothing looks different, but if we look at unique again, we have just one. So what this str.strip strip is doing is it, it removes the white space at the front and back of the of the string. And so now we just have that one variable there. So this is definitely something we might we will want to clean up and was revealed in our exploration. I think that this is definitely something we're going to do in the future as we start to think about how, what models you want to build. We're definitely noticing some interesting patterns in this data. We're seeing a, a number of small features that appear as a function of some of these production systems or possibly as a function of some of these production systems. We aren't controlling for something. So there's other confounding variables that could still be involved. Recall that this data frame has, you know, we also have the scan type. So what I might do here is modify it to see if we can control for scan type. So let's group by production system. So let's kind of get to this point here. And before doing that, let's set the, let's set a query at the beginning of this. And I want the scan type to be, let's say scan type equals, let's do on meet. And let's make sure we don't need that bracket there. And for consistency, let's just put it on this line. Okay. So we're looking at just the material that was scanned directly on the meet. We're looking at, we're grouping by production system, taking the average data, and let's remove the sample number, transpose the data, and plot that data. And you can see when we start controlling it, some of that major variance, variation goes away. So this is why ensuring we're not overly confounding the experiment. If we switch to TP, we get a lot of variation. Again, now this could be because we're not controlling for frozen versus thawed, which we know had a significant impact on TP. So if any of these variables, maybe the two star was primarily frozen or thawed, that could really impact, especially out here. We just saw that in the, in the earlier data when we looked at the through package. So again, these are the sorts of things that I'm putting together to understand this material. And I think this is something that could be contributing to some of these differences, but that's just part of the process. Um, this organic one is really interesting. It's really flat. Uh, the MAR, I don't recall what that is. So let's look at it again. Marinated chicken, I think was something that they were kind of using as one of the, not necessarily standard, but more of a control. Um, so just really, again, a really interesting way to look at all this data to understand what we've got. And just going variable by variable, or parameter permanent in this case. So uh, I think this is giving us a really good indication 
I think the last thing I want to do in this case, and then I'll do a part two to avoid this video getting too long, is um, is looking at how correlated these these production systems are, just to kind of give you a sense that for many of these, although they look very different, the signals are still highly correlated to each other. So let's take this particular chain of commands. Look here, and let's get rid of the plot. Let's keep the transpose. And let's now, after all of that, add the dot correlation method. And now we're looking at how correlated these various materials are to each other. And so one star versus two star, uh, one star versus corn fed chicken, etc. And let's plot this. So I don't think I've imported Seaborn. I have not. Okay. So in this cell, I'll import Seaborn. That's SNS. So as you can see in this video, I really am exploring this in real time. Um, so I don't necessarily know which which modules and libraries I want to import it until I get to it. So I want to import Seaborn because I want to make a heat map. And let's do Seaborn.heatmap. And that's because the output of this is this correlation matrix, which is best viewed, in my opinion, as a heat map. And you will see that once this cell runs, it takes a little bit longer. And um, if this heat map might be somewhat deceiving because it, it looks like there's a massive difference between the samples. So let's set the V min equal to zero and the V max equal to one. And let's do this. Let's take C map equal to Viridis. Viridis. So when we, when we do it this way, you see that when we look at the full range of correlation values or, or half the range between zero and one, most of these values are really close to one. If we raise the V min, the value min for the color bar to half, you see that st even then most of the values are in this 0.9 or 90% correlated to completely correlated. Usually in this case, you would see, you know, this diagonal is really the only highly correlated region and there's more variation. And so we really are trying to track very small changes of signal amongst these materials. Now, some of these things we might not be able to parse out, but this is why pattern recognition really matters because if we just look at these visually, there aren't many differences that we can get a hold of. So very likely, while your eye might be drawn to these large differences here, we're probably looking at some of these smaller features that pop up on top of the peaks as our signal. And so that's why, again, we will be exploring the data in the next video using multivariate techniques such as PCA, maybe manifold approaches uh, like TSNE, um, and then other types. And then we'll start defining what we want our actual experiment to be as we build this model. Uh, we might have to kind of tweak this. Maybe we want to build a, a test to see if, if chicken is organic or not, or um, other conditions for quality. So we'll work through that together. Uh, I'm not going to do too much prep for that video as well. I really want you to see how I think through these problems and hopefully to give you some ideas as you explore this data. We learned a lot from a few plots. Um, these are all very simple chained methods. So I hope this also gives you confidence to just explore your own and then um, put together some projects in your day-to-day -day work. In any case, I'll see you in the next video. Peace. Subscribe to the channel. Bye.